Today I have on our NCSA Coach Podcast, Coach uh, Rich Calvert from Drake University. Uh, Drake is actually a Division One program located in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, but Drake is actually part of the Missouri Valley Conference and just clinched their first MVC regular season title uh, since 1993 this past season. So really excited to have you, Coach Calvert, on the line. Uh, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit more about your background, um, kind of how you came to Drake and uh, obviously your background with Drake. It's been uh, quite a journey in terms of the number of years. I've kind of lost track. I think we're getting into the um, the mid twenties or so, as far as uh, mid to upper twenties, is how long I've been around. But it's been a nice journey, though. Uh, I spent some uh, quality time at some very good places. Started at Illinois State University, which is where I had undergrad and. Uh, also, my graduate studies there, and then spent about three years at Ohio State, followed up by uh, six years as an assistant at University of Iowa, which also included a couple of trips to the World Series. So that was kind of a, a real neat experience. And then I think all three of those have kind of set some good foundations for my time here at Drake, which I just uh, finished uh, year 13, and I uh, oh absolutely love it here. It's, <laughs> it's um it's it's a perfect fit for me in terms of the size, type of people that we get to work with every day, and then along with the type of student athletes that we're able to have here at Drake. Absolutely. Kind of talking about Drake, do you mind giving us a little bit more information um, kind of on the program, maybe what makes it a unique school or kind of uh, some things that are really appealing about the university? First of all, it's obviously the academics are as good as you'll find in any other place in, in, in the country. You know, we, we have a couple of majors that are very, very good, and, and I think all of them are good, but I think a couple stand out in terms of pharmacy, health science, school of business uh, would probably be the ones that really stand out. But I, I think probably the biggest and, and best experience you could have here is the relationship that you're able to develop with the professors, mm -hmm. being the size of school that we have. The student-teacher ratio is somewhere around 14 to 1, and um, you're never going to have a class over the size of 30, and so um, it's a great bonding connecting with um, the professors that actually are at the top of their line in their field. And so what better way to uh, learn about your program when you get a deal directly one-on-one -on -one with the professors, and, um, and, and it's just the overall experience of that there, I think, replaces, it far outweighs any other thing that you're going to get at any other university. Talk to me a little bit about uh, some goals that maybe you and the coaching staff set from pro for the program kind of year to year, if you don't mind. I don't know if I'd call them goals or more of destinations, and those don't change every year. It's it's basically uh, win the, the, the regular season conference crown, win uh, hopefully the, the conference tournament, and advance on to NCAA uh, regional play. Pretty cut and dry, um, <laughs> you know, and I think – you know, everybody, I think, depending on where they're at, has very similar goals or destinations. And, you know, that's we really don't talk a whole lot about them because that's kind of a given. But the thing that we really hopefully focus on is get better every day. That's a goal that, you know, is attainable every day. And if you don't attain it one day, then you can always attain it the next day. Absolutely. And hopefully all those good things along the way will get you to your destination at the end of the year. Talk a little bit about academics. Obviously, Drake's a higher academic institution. Talk to us about the uh, the program, obviously, on the softball side of things. I know in the past, obviously, we've had some high GPAs. We've really done some good things academically. Well, I, I think that's where the program starts at, first and foremost, is, is the academics. I always tell parents and uh, prospective students that I don't want your head buried in a book for four years. That's That's not the college experience. So what we have to do on the front end is make sure we identify students that are going to be successful here at Drake on the academic side. And mm -hmm. because bottom line is once, you know, your four years is up here, nobody is going to remember how many times you strike out or how many home runs you hit. It's going to be about what you've done during those four years that have set you up for the rest of your life. And so I think that's what we've always tried to instill here in everybody that comes here. Yeah, softball is a great outlet from the academic side. Everybody's very passionate about it. Everybody loves to win. But the bottom line is, what's the bigger picture? And, and that's something that we always try to keep uh, at the front. 
No, and obviously, um, you know, we, we focus in on academics, and obviously we're looking for, you know, the best candidates, you know, that are going to be the best fit for Drake. But talk to me a little bit from a coach's standpoint what your schedule looks like. I know obviously summer's winding down, so if you can kind of clue us in on what the summer looks like as far as a Division One coach and kind of what your responsibilities are. And then talk to us a little bit about how that transitions through the fall semester. I think I'm not sure if I'm the, the best candidate to, to ask <laughs> what a Division One coach does during the summer because I think, first of all, everybody's resources are a little bit different as far Absolutely. as where they're going to recruit from, uh, what tournaments they're going to go to, and so forth. One of the unique things that we have here in the summer is obviously our high school ball is being played. So that's something we – do a lot of, especially in the month of June, is going out and trying to see, you know, a handful of games here each week and trying to figure out, do we just need to stay in Iowa as far as finding players that we feel can play here at Drake? And then we're going to throw in some tournaments. Uh, usually we're going to stay as regional as, as we can. You know, we're going to start here in the city of Des Moines and just kind of keep going a little bit further, a little bit further until we feel that what we think is, is good prospects here. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have a uh, prospect from California or Texas or, or our state like that. It's just it's easier, I think, from our standpoint with our resources and the type of school we have is, is to kind of stay as Midwest as we can. As far as getting back to the, to the recruiting in the summer, obviously we're going to try to get to some of those tournaments that are Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City and such that are going to give us a good representation of the Midwest. We also mix in there the Colorado tournaments uh, that are over the 4th of July. And then as far as a national tournament, it just kind of depends on where we're at in the whole recruiting process. You know, do we have our offers out? Do we have our commitments? It just kind of are, are we looking at some players that are playing in these national tournaments? So it kind of just varies from year to year. Once the school year starts and, you know, we get kind of in the fall recruiting that's kind of where we start really kind of looking at maybe hopefully finishing up whatever class that we're on and then looking towards the next class after that. We're, we're, we're kind of have to get too far ahead sure. um, in our whole recruiting process. And, you know, there's everybody's got their own theory on how early is it, do you need to recruit and stuff. But we, we try not to get too far ahead, but at the same time, we're not going to sit back and like we did in the old days and, you know, make decisions on when they become a senior as sure. far as who we're going to bring in and stuff. And so I, I think from our standpoint for Division One, mm -hmm. we're not going to get a whole lot of numbers in terms of people on our board that we're looking at. We're basically going to look at a couple at a time and figure out if they're a good fit. And if they are, we'll make offers. They accept. Boom, we're done. If not, yeah. then we'll figure out who's left and, and kind of continue from there. Work through there. Yeah, absolutely. From a standpoint, obviously, of being inundated with so much information, I mean, obviously, you can probably imagine during the summer, you know, you're receiving emails from student athletes about their tournaments, game times, field locations, things like that. Do you feel like there's a, a shift, obviously, obviously, from summer to fall is kind of in regards to your schedule of being able to communicate more with athletes? Or what does that dynamic look like? Well, you know, the technology that we live in today is a heck of a lot different than what I first started <laughs> at. Um, sure. Yeah, there's a lot more people that are giving you information on tournaments and interest and stuff as it was 10 years ago and even five mm -hmm. years ago. And so I, I think you just have to filter through each email as far as does this fit your profile that you want in a student athlete? Is it a position that you currently need? Is the academics a fit? You know, where are they from? Are we going to be able to see them? You know, there's some prospects that we get information on that we don't have the resources to go and watch them play, and those are tournaments that we typically never go to. So okay. for us to kind of really follow up on them, it's going to be very difficult. And so, so I think, you know, you just have to filter through the information that you get and figure out and, and see, you know what, this may be somebody you want to make, take a look at. And then the other ones, you just kind of, you know, unfortunately it's just not going to work out. Absolutely. Talking kind of about what you look for in a student athlete, and obviously we talk about making sure the academics are there, but do you feel like there are any things that you typically look for in an athlete right off the bat, or do you feel like there's something that separates one athlete from the next? My biggest thing in looking at 
student athletes. Obviously, the academics is going to be at the forefront. But once we get past that, I think in terms of just uh, the physical ability, I, I want to see how they play catch. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to see how they run because those are the two things that we as coaches really cannot teach. You know, you're, you're basically, your arm strength is your arm strength. Yeah, you can get it a little bit better, but uh, the throwing motion and everything, that's been developed over, you know, a since they first picked time. up a ball. <laughs> yep. And, you know, obviously your, your running ability is the same thing. You know, we can work on that, but you're really not going to change that a whole lot in terms of getting it better. So from our standpoint, those are probably the first two things that we look at just because it's a good starting point. Now, those aren't going to be prevent us from maybe looking at a kid, but those are going to be some things that we're going to feel more attracted to the kid in the first place. And then obviously you look at the other things, such as hitting, position that they do play. You know, the one thing that I always like to do look at is the interaction they have with their coaches, with their players, and with their parents because yeah. – Obviously, you want a player that's going to represent you in a, in a positive manner, and both on the field and off. And so, um, you know, you just kind of look and, and kind of see, you know, how they relate to those people. And then you also kind of watch mom and dad a little bit too because uh, you want to make sure that you get good parents in your program as well. And um, you don't have to be wanting to deal with somebody like that that's going to maybe – not represent your program as well as you would like. And so hopefully we try to identify who the parents are and kind of kind of see how they are as well, as, as, along with the prospect. Absolutely. Do you feel like, um, obviously, maybe when student-athletes or prospective student-athletes are coming on campus, you know, kind of setting them up with girls on the team is a huge factor? I mean, do you really kind of weigh in on your current team for feedback on players? Yes and no. You know, the hard part in terms of where we're at in, in this recruiting process or the cycle that we're in in terms of these early commitments. The thing is, the players that are currently on your team, a lot of them, unless they're freshmen or sophomores, aren't going to have much contact with the prospect coming in. Basically, your juniors and seniors are going to be gone, yep. so you're dealing with the freshmen and sophomores. Even before that, you know, you think about you're taking a, a, a junior that's in high school, the majority of her teammates are the class ahead of her, which is not even on campus yet, mm -hmm. uh, her class, which who knows who that's going to be, and the class after that. So there's a lot of unknowns in terms of who your teammates are actually going to be. And so I think from a coach's standpoint, you have to let them know that this is the type of student athletes that we recruit and have our program represent. Hopefully it shouldn't change a whole lot, but this is the gist as far as what our team usually is like. And so, um, but at the same time, you do try to get them involved with your current players and just so they could kind of share some things about what they like about Drake and, and things that they don't like about Drake. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of a little bit of both, I think. Talking about timelines, I know we kind of uh, talked a little bit, obviously, about the early commitments and things like that. Where are you at right now with your recruiting timeline? Have, what grad classes have we finished up? What are we working with? Obviously, we have a group of freshmen coming in here in a week that will, is right now, what, 2015s. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also been fortunate enough to finish our 2016s class. And our 2017 class, we have offers out to, which is what I would say. So if you look in, in terms of juniors and seniors and sophomores and whatnot, typically what we like to do is make, um, hopefully have commitments, <clears throat> excuse me, done by, I would say, January 1 of uh, their junior year. Mm -hmm. um, it may be still a little bit early, but we can't wait much longer because I think you're going to lose out on some players if, if, you, if you do. But I don't want to go any earlier because, again, I think there's still some development being made in those players, and they may not have fully developed yet, and you're missing out on some good players. And they're still, you know, even to this day, you know, I say we're done with our, our class of 2016. There's still some very good players out there in that class that have just developed late and maybe have not been seen or what have you. And so, um, but at the same time, I, you know, we're all caught up in the same cycle, and unfortunately, <laughs> you know, we, we have to, you know, in order to kind of keep pace with everybody, it's almost you have to follow line and do what everybody else is doing. You know, we're entering juniors in high school. We are, have made offers, too, and hopefully we'll get some decisions soon. And then 
once that's done, then we'll move on to the sophomores. And, and that's we don't jump ahead. I, I've never been a fan of trying to jump ahead because I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> if our incoming freshmen are going to pan out to what I think they are. And, you know, we don't know that. Maybe we need another position that I didn't think we're going to need because of what these freshmen that are coming in here in a week can or can't do. And so uh, maybe I found a, something that I didn't know I had, and so now I don't need it down the line. So it's kind of just a, a little give and take, and, and, you know, we're not perfect by any ways, and, you know, we, we miss a lot more than we get a lot of times, <laughs> and so we just try to do the best we can. Talking about the academics, obviously, um, you know, making sure that a student athlete is going to be qualified as far as the admissions department. Do you have a suggestion typically when you have student athletes that have interest in Drake to take their test scores to kind of get that baseline score so that gives you an idea of kind of, you know, a little bit more on kind of the recruiting end, if that makes sense? Yeah. At the same time, though, I, I think the student needs to take it when they feel they're ready to take it. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not ready their sophomore year, wait till your junior year. You yeah. know, the one thing that I will look at that's going to stand out to me way more than a test score is what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, yeah. what their GPA is from their freshman to their sophomore year because that, to me, is a little bit more indicative of taking a test on a Saturday morning. <laughs> yep, and, I agree. Um, and so I think, you know, now, obviously if they're, you know, in the lower 20s, then we're probably not looking at a pharmacy major here. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, mm -hmm. I think it's that day-to-day. -day. And the other thing that I'm going to look at a little bit more, especially on the transcript, and even when they do take the test, is I want to see what that student athlete is doing in the, in the reading and the writing portion of that curriculum because, those are two things that no matter what major that you have in college, you cannot get away from reading and writing. <laughs> you know, we, we could, you know, take the one math class and be done with it. We could take the one science class and be done with it. But we have to be able to read and write. And so those are probably what I'm going to look at more than anything else, especially on the transcript and especially on the test score. Absolutely. Kind of talking and getting to the travel ball side of things, I get a lot of questions from student athletes of, you know, does my travel team play a huge role, obviously, on me getting recruited? You know, does playing year-round, you know, make a huge deal in me getting recruited? Can you shed some light on kind of your own um, personal experiences or own personal opinions on, you know, whether it be the travel team that a student athlete plays for or how important it is for a student athlete to play year-round in your own recruiting experiences? I'm probably going against the norm here. Uh, <laughs> I figured but, it's my uh, that's why I'm asking it. My thing is I want you to play as many sports as possible mm -hmm. um, and move on from season to season to season to season. Some of our best players that we've ever had here and that I've ever coached through my entire career have been multi-sport athletes. One is because I think they still have that burning passion when they get to college because they're not burned out and yeah. playing softball 365 days a year. They've got to enjoy other experiences where maybe they're not the best player on the team. And so they fit into maybe a role type of player. Well, I think that's good when you move on to the next level, whatever college, you know, level you're playing at, because, you know, even though you may be the best player, softball player on your team, as you move up, that is probably not going to be the case. So yeah. you may not be playing every game like you were, when you were in high school or travel ball or what have you. And so you have to learn what it's like to be on the bench. And I think maybe some of these other sports can help you realize what it's like to be a role player. So to me, playing all sports all the time for as long as you want, to me, is, is very, very important. And that's something that we try to look at in the process, too. Or other sports that play basketball, to me, is a huge one because I think it's one of those great sports that teaches a lot about Everything, you know, it's, it's, for one, it's a great team sport. And you can be skilled in a lot of different areas but still be a part of that team because there's so many qualities that you need to be a, a good basketball player with. The other thing, too, is you need to take some time off and, and yeah. put the ball down, uh, just not only from a physical standpoint but from a mental standpoint as well. And, and go do something else, you know, whether it's – even if it's not another sport, just – Enjoy doing something else and get taking a break from the game. Now, 
there's exceptions. I know there's kids out there that love to play, can play 365 days a year, <laughs> and never get tired of it. Absolutely. I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen, but I've seen it too many times where it's all about trying to get that scholarship at the next level, and all they're doing is going from place to place to place to showcase to showcase, clinic to clinic to clinic, and it's all about trying to get that, and then all of a sudden they get that, and now what do they do? Yeah. And I, I see them lose, like I said, a lot of that passion, um, especially when they get to college. Yeah. And it's not what they'd hope. Taking time and, and, and enjoying doing something else to me is, is a much bigger thing. You know, the other thing in terms of club ball versus high school, I'm a big proponent of playing high school ball because, again, it is, it's with your friends that you've grown up, it's your peers, it's your closest friends. And, yes, it may not be the quality of ball that you're used to club ball, but, you know, so what? In today's world, if you're good enough with all the technology that we have out there, people are going to find you. Mm -hmm. It's not like the old days where, especially in Iowa, where you couldn't find somebody because they played on a high school team and didn't play club ball and they were, they were missed. That doesn't happen today. There, yeah. There's too many avenues out there, whether it's through – uh, recruiting centers to where it's through going to showcases, going to clinics, you know, plan on travel. There's just too much out there for for most kids to slip through the cracks and not get mm -hmm. noticed. So to me, I, I'm all about, you know, the old school in terms of just, you know, enjoy doing other things, enjoy playing other sports. Kind of talking about the camps and the clinics, is there any advice that you have for student athletes on how they can stand out at camps and clinics? I know obviously kind of rolling through the fall here, student athletes are going to be receiving a lot of information from, you know, a lot of different schools based upon come to this clinic, come to this clinic. So any kind of piece of advice from a coach's standpoint of, you know, how to sort through some of those camp invites or maybe how to really kind of set yourself apart when you are going to be at that clinic? Again, I'm probably going against the norm on this. <laughs> Again, I, I, I think, unfortunately, our clinics have changed over the years. They're yeah. no more what I consider teaching clinics. They're more recruiting clinics, in a sense, and um, which to me is not what a clinic is for. A clinic is to go and learn and try to improve and, and, and take a couple things from each clinic and, and get better and work mm -hmm. at it. Now it seems like, you know, the last couple of years, you know, it happens here when we have clinics. They're not coming here to learn. They're coming here to show off what you skills see. they have yeah. and hopefully you'll recruit them. You know, as far as an advice on picking a clinic, you know, go to a clinic that, to me, that you're going to learn something and pick up something that's going to make you a better player. To me, that's what clinics are about. And, you know, that's what we try to do here. Our clinics are real small, and we're here to teach. We, we want you to take some ideas that – we think is important in the game and hopefully incorporate them in, in your game and see if you can get better. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of trying to get to as many clinics as you can, but the reason I want you to get to as many clinics as you can is to learn about different ways to do things mm -hmm. and pick up one or two things that you could incorporate that's going to make you a better player. So um, as far as picking clinics out, I, you know, that's, you know, I would say go to the smaller ones because then those are the ones that you're going to get a little bit more, more personal. attention. Yeah. You know, and then you're not going to be standing in the line of 20, mm -hmm. and you might get three swings, and then you're back to the end of the line. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to single out a clinic here or there, but, uh, you know, you just got to pick and choose what's going to work best for you and um, where you think you're going to learn the most at as opposed to, you know, I want to go and show the coach what I could do. Absolutely. Um, talk to me a little bit about some do's and don'ts um, that you have advice on for student athletes through this process. I would say probably the, one of the biggest pet peeves I have in the recruiting process, and I guess this could go both ways, and I'm not just trying to single out the, the student athlete on this, but, and this is kind of, and I'm going to be trying to give you a, a rule of thumb that I try to put that by. If a player has visited campus, and has expressed interest to you, and at least, and in, in you have offered, the, the coach has offered a scholarship to that person, at least have the dignity to pick the phone up and call them and let them know that maybe that they have chosen to go someplace else, mm -hmm. as opposed to a text or an email. That's 
uh, to me is is probably my biggest pet peeve that I've seen throughout the years uh, because it's the easy way out. Mm-hmm. They don't have to deal with the talking to the coach and, and stuff. And, you know, us coaches, we have been through this a lot more times than we would like in terms of on the no side. Mm-hmm. Um, that's part of the process, you know. But at the same time, that's what the student athlete needs to be able to do. That's part of growing as far as making those difficult phone calls and, and letting them know that they've decided to go someplace else. Yeah. And as opposed to getting an email or a, a phone call on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock on my office phone when you know dang well that I'm not going to be in my office at 8 o'clock on a Sunday <laughs> night. Um, but at the same time, I, I think the coaches are – at fault in some of this as well in terms of not following through on bringing you in on a visit, calling you, uh, this and that and stuff. And so, I, you know, I would say the best thing is, you know, the technology obviously has changed what we do in recruiting. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about it. Um, the emails that we received today versus five years ago versus virtually none ten years ago, and it was handwritten letters, mm-hmm. um, is, is really helped in terms of, obviously getting the student-athlete prospect name out there and letting the coach know where they're going to play and stuff um, is real helpful. And at the same time, you know, we're not going to be able to see everybody play. It's just impossible. And that's what we have to go through and filter through our process and figure out where we're going to be at, you know, who else do we need to see. You know, bottom line is the whole recruiting process sometimes is pure luck. I, I think being at the right place at the right time. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how many times that I've gone down to watch somebody that I thought was going to be somebody we wanted to take a good look at, and then I find out her teammate or somebody else in the other team ends up being the person that we want instead. Yeah. There's a lot of coaches out there that will tell you exactly that. And, you know, I would say half of our team right now is, is based upon that. We just were in the right place at the right time. You know, the videos is the other thing. You know, a lot of times, you know, I, and I'll be honest, I would say 95% of the videos are going to probably tell us no. Just yeah. the basic what we're looking at. You know, the other 5% are going to pique our interest, and we're going to probably try to follow up with them if it works into our schedule in terms of where we're going, game times, and whatnot and stuff. Sure. Absolutely. Kind of talking about student athletes, obviously, initiating contact. We talked about how, you know, technology has changed. I'm sure, obviously, you get a lot of emails and videos and things like that. But as a coach, do you get a lot of phone calls from student athletes? You know, I, we get a fair amount. Um, I would say maybe one to two a week, and I know that varies from institution to institution. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I, I think it depends on how much time you spend in the office, too, as far yeah. as, you know, them leaving a message, because obviously, you know, most of the calls are received are from uh, prospects that we can't return calls to. So basically what, when we get a call like that, you know, I'll basically say, hey, here's where we're at recruiting-wise. Send, email me, let me know your schedule. Hopefully we'll be able to connect up at some times, and, you know, sometimes we'll give them a background yep. on our school and stuff. But it's just, you know, I, I think the one thing as far as from the prospects side of it is pick out about five schools that you really, really have an interest in. And then maybe pick up the phone and maybe try connecting to the coach and say, what are you looking for in this class? may not need a picture of that class. Well, then that would eliminate you. You know, <laughs> and then, again, yeah. the, hard, the hard thing at this point in time is when, you know, we're talking about sophomores potentially here in high school, things change. Injuries, players leave the program. So, you know, you may be done today. That doesn't mean you're going to be done tomorrow. For sure. Or the next day, or next month. And so, so I would say from a prospect's point of view is, you know, reach out to maybe, you know, I said five, maybe three schools, and just give them a call to say your top three schools and just say, you know, where are you at in recruiting? What's your interest? Hey, if you get a chance, I'm in the area. Can you come watch me play and stuff? Mm-hmm. And take a look and see if I'm a good fit for your program. And, you know, but the thing that you got to remember in terms of from the prospects, there are a lot of schools out there. Oh, that, for sure. Um, have softball. It, it may not be a uh, the top division one school. It may not be in the middle division one school. And, you know, there's a lot of different levels. You just got to figure out where your level is at and go play. Softball still softball. There's some great stories out there of players that have played NAI ball 
uh, mm-hmm. Division Two, Division Three, that have had great experiences and wouldn't have changed it for the world. And yeah, you see all the bells and whistles on TV about the high-profile Division Ones. Yeah, those are great too, to some extent. But there's only a, so many of those out there. And think of all the other schools that don't have that. So I'm not saying you shouldn't dream and think big time, but also think of what's realistic for you as well. Speaking of that, do you have any, I know we kind of, we haven't really touched too much on the parent side of things, but do you have any advice for parents in this process? Uh, yeah, let the kid make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go for um, it. <laughs> the, the biggest thing, you know, that seems to be a problem, and it's, it's been every generation, it's just I think with technology now it seems like it's multiplied, but, you know, we've heard of the term helicopter parents and not letting them go and trying to make decisions for themselves. It's only going to make it rougher on the prospect down the road if the parents are that type of controlling environment. And those are the ones that, quite honestly, that that we look for when we go out recruiting because, obviously, those are not the type of parents that we want to represent our program. You know, the one thing is that I, you know, that we sit here and I I talk to student-athletes and their parents about it. I said, I'm not going to hold your hand. This is your degree. I got my degree some <laughs> almost 30 years ago now. You know, I did that. Uh, so did my assistants. It's, 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 it's your degree. What we need to make sure that we do a good job of is in after you're finished here in four years that you are ready to go out in the world and be your own person and make decisions and be able to, if, a, if something comes up that is not the most ideal, how are you going to be able to handle it? You know, we're not going to replace mom and dad, and I don't want you to throw mom and dad off the side, but at the same time, I think mom and dad need to realize it's it's time. You've done a great job to this point. It's time to let go. Yeah, it's also when you get back to, you know what, let the student athlete make the decision on what school to go to because they're the ones that has to go to school there. Mm-hmm. Mom and dad already had done that. Their, their time has passed. Now, I, I think there needs to be some guidance there. I'm not saying that don't say a word in the whole thing, but, <laughs> you know, there needs to be some guidance and there needs to be some thought-provoking questions that you have towards that prospect. But at the same time, it's got to be what the prospect wants. They're the one that has to go to school. There. They're the one that has to play for this particular program and or have these teammates and stuff. And, you know, the parents are there. They're the they're there for support, but at the same time, I think they need to let the student-athlete or the prospective student-athlete do the talking because that's the one thing sometimes I see, and we've all experienced it in the campus is where the parents dominate. And you know what? They're not going to school. I, I, I want your daughter to, to do the talking because they're the ones going to school. And sometimes that's hard. That's hard mm-hmm. because that's just how they've been raised and stuff. But yeah, the one advice I'd have for for the parents is just, you know, again, kind of palm just a bit, but then let them go. That's awesome. Well uh, well said there. If you had any last few takeaways um, to kind of give student-athletes going through this process or any parents um, that might be listening, what would your final piece of advice be? Take your time. Don't rush into it. Just because everybody else on the team is committed doesn't mean that you have to commit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of softball positions open at all levels out there. It may not be the Division One high level that seems to be working on 7th and 8th graders at this point, but don't jump at the first one. Yeah. Sit back. I always, you know, when I make a, I, I make an offer to a prospect, you know, I, I don't want you to be an impulse buyer. You know, we all go to the mall and we all make that purchase <laughs> and then we get home and you're like, I didn't need this. Why did I make this? Why did purchase? I buy it? Yeah. And it's the same thing in terms of, you know, everything may be great. You love everything about it. Go home and think about it. You know, sure. let it sink in. And, you know, if after a couple of days or a week or then it's where you want to be, then fine. Go ahead and do it. Uh, the other thing is get out and, and make sure that you visit some different schools. You know, you might have one dream school and you may go visit there and everything was great, but why don't you go and take a look at some other schools, you know, that because you don't want that what-if factor down the road, especially when you're making decisions as early as some of these prospects are making decisions. You, you need to go out and, and do your homework. And so basically, in other words, is don't rush into it. Take your time, 
the, the thing you don't realize is ultimately if the coach wants you bad enough, they will wait for you. But, you know, they don't, you know, some coaches will give you a deadline and say, you have till this. Well, how bad do they really want you? Now, there's got to be some give and take there. I'm not saying that they, they need to prolong it for forever, but I, at the same time, I think there needs to be some give and take. You need to be able to have a reasonable amount of time to go and take a look at schools that you want to take a look at. And yeah. so you can make the best possible decision and stuff. So I, I would say that the bottom line was just trying to be patient with it, try not to get caught up in how other teammates are, are going through the process and what their experience and stuff. And, uh, and eventually I think you'll find the right fit if you're able to make those decisions. 